Our first scripture reading this morning comes from Philippians chapter 1, verses 27 through 30, found on page 197 of the New Testament in your Pew Bible. Before we read together, let us pray. Lord, open our heart and minds by the power of your spirit that as we read and hear your word, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Please join me in reading Philippians chapter 1, verses 27 through 30. Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, driving side by side with one mind, faith of the gospel, and are in no way intimidated by your opponents. For them, this is evidence of their disruption of your salvation, and this is God's doing. For he has graciously granted you the privilege not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well. Since you are having the same struggle that you saw I had, and now here that I still have. The word of the Lord. The second scripture reading comes from Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 28, found on page 7 of the New Testament. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on rock. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Now when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as their scribes. The word of the Lord. Thank you, Elizabeth. You will note that the offertory number for today, Come to the Table, was composed by her grandfather, uh, Alan Pote. Join me in prayer, if you will. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. The character issue is back. It certainly was in vogue during the years of Bill Clinton's presidency as well as the Trump administration. And sadly today for many people, including many evangelicals, ideology and party will prevail over character every time. I personally am not in that group. I am one who believes that how a person is in private life does affect professional performance. To me, it comes down to integrity and credibility and the ability to make good judgment calls. I need to feel that people with whom I do business or who hold public office can be trusted to do the right thing in all situations. There might be public debate over the issue of character in the world of politics, but I can assure you that in the church virtually all people believe that private and public character cannot be separated for Christians. As we all know, the church has suffered for years over the allegation that there are too many hypocrites in the church. And as all of us know, scandal in the private lives of church leaders and church members seriously hurts the the witness of the church and the Christian faith. So character and conduct have always been issues in the Christian faith and in the church. 
To be sure, Christianity is not, first of all, a way of life or an ethical system. It is, first of all, a relationship of love that God has established with us through Jesus Christ. But in response to the love of God that we experience in Jesus, and as Jesus' followers, it is expected of us that we seek to emulate Him in our daily lives. His teachings and other parts of the Scriptures are the standards and guidelines for shaping our character and conduct according to His will and way. In our lesson today from the letter to the Philippians, we find the Apostle Paul addressing the character and conduct issue. He recognizes that it is vitally important to the life and witness of the Christian faith and the work and worship of the church that the Christians in Philippi live lives that are worthy of the gospel of Christ. So he emphasizes that point with them. Listen again to his appeal. Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel, and are in no way intimidated by your opponents. For them, this is evidence of their destruction, but of your salvation. And this is God's doing. For he has graciously granted you the privilege not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well. In the background here is the fact that Christianity was a new movement, and the Philippian Christians were a minority group. So it was very important to Paul that the Christians behave in a way that would bring credibility to the Christian faith. To make his point, he begins with basic conduct. Live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. One of the great Presbyterian preachers of the modern era, Dr. William Elliot, once wrote, Christianity is not merely a set of intellectual or theological ideas to be accepted. It is that, to be sure, but it is something much more than that. It is also a certain kind of life to be lived in the ordinary relationships of life. Christianity is more than a philosophy to be discussed. It is an ethic to be applied. It is concerned not only with what people believe, but also how they behave, with attitudes they show and the words they speak. Our faith is not only something to be revered in the sanctuary, it is something to be lived out and demonstrated at home, in the office, on the street, at the country club. As Christians and as members of the church, you and I represent Christ and the church wherever we are every day. And I hope that we try to conduct ourselves in such a way that we bring credit to Christ and His church. It might be true that the world will not always take notice of the good ways in which we model Christ and the church. 
But the world certainly takes notice when we fail. Most ministers by far represent Christ well in their conduct and most people simply accept that as a matter of course. Thank goodness the clergy scandals are infrequent enough that they make news. Most likely people who know that you are a Christian and a member of the church will not take particular notice if your conduct is exemplary, though some will. But believe me, if you do something illegal or immoral, or if you use foul language, or if you are abrasive in your personal relationships, they will surely notice it, and that will be detrimental to the Christian gospel. Most of you, I imagine, remember Edgar Guest's famous poem about this. A part of it bears repeating. I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. <clears throat> I'd rather one should walk with me than merely tell the way. The eyes a better pupil and more willing than the ear. Fine counsel is confusing, but examples always clear. And the best of the preachers are the people who live their creeds. For to see good put in action is what everybody needs. It makes a lot of difference to Christ and the church for Christians to be faithful and loving and kind in marriage and family relationships. It makes a lot of difference to Christ and the church for Christians to be competent and fair and honest in work responsibilities and relationships. It makes a lot of difference to Christ and the church for Christians to be generous in their support of church and community causes. It makes a lot of difference to Christ and the church for Christians to be faithful in worship and prayer and Christian education. It makes a lot of difference to Christ and the church for Christians to live lifestyles of simplicity and good taste and moderation and in keeping with the moral traditions of our faith. It makes a lot of difference to Christ and the church when Christians are warm, loving, and self-giving people. As Sheldon Van Auken says in his book, A Severe Mercy, the best argument for Christianity is Christians, their joy, their certainty, their completeness. But when the strongest argument against Christianity is also Christians, when they are somber and joyless and smug, then Christianity dies a thousand deaths. It helps me to control and to modify my behavior when I remember that I represent Christ and the church wherever I am every day of my life. It is not always easy to maintain a standard of conduct and behavior that is worthy of the gospel of Christ in a world that is increasingly secular and pagan. All of us face intense pressure to conform to the mores of the world around us. So did the Christians in Philippi, and Paul gave them some wise counsel that we would do well to hear too. He urged them to stand firm in one spirit, 
striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel. We always all recognize that there is safety in numbers and that we do better when we have a community of support. I have long been an admirer of Alcoholics Anonymous. They have clearly demonstrated the the effectiveness of group support in attaining and maintaining sobriety. And one of the negative consequences of the COVID pandemic to me is that so many people have not returned to the work and worship of the church. The church has always recognized that it is virtually impossible to go it alone as a Christian in this world. That is why coming together in worship services and and Sunday school classes and circles are so necessary and helpful and and successful. If If we stand firm together by meeting together regularly for worship and study and prayer and fellowship and mutual support, we are much more effective in maintaining character that is worthy of the gospel. Indeed, it was Paul's belief that if we keep our focus on Christ and the church, we need not fear our enemies. God, he asserts, will give us the victory, but even if our way of life leads us to suffer for his sake, then he contends that will be a privilege and not a tragedy. I find myself seriously challenged by this lesson. And for what it is worth, I close by sharing with you my personal goal. When, hopefully years from now, I lie down to die. I want to be able to say of myself, and I want others to be able to say of me, not that I was successful, though that will be nice, but that I was faithful to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to my wife and my family, to the churches that I have served, to the communities in which I have lived, and to my country, to be counted worthy of the gospel of Christ, to me, would be life's highest honor. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Go forth with steady step as you face the days ahead. Live certain that in many ways God provides faith for darkened hours, courage in despairing nights, calm in depressing circumstances. Revel in your joy. Recall your blessings. Walk in the light. So live that if among days it were your last, it would represent in living your finest, in loving your Savior, in dying a final benediction of noble character. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.